Well, hello, Resonate Missoula family. Uh, throughout this summer, we have been in a sermon series called A Church in Crisis, where we've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians. And so last Sunday, I preached on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, on the topic of marriage and intimacy. You can find that recording on our YouTube page. But in this supplemental video, I'm going to be walking through another topic that comes up in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and that topic is singleness. So I'm going to read some selected passages from 1 Corinthians 7, and then I have seven observations to make from this text that can help us inform our understanding of singleness. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Verses 25 through 28. Now concerning the betrothed, the engaged, I have no command from the Lord, from Jesus, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. And then finally, verses 32 through 35. Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So seven observations from this text. Number one, number one, some have the gift of celibacy and some do not. Some have the gift of celibacy and some do not. Uh, verse seven, I wish that all were as I myself am. Paul is saying, I wish all were as I am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So God has created each of us with a gift, a wiring, an inclination, or a desire, or an ability toward either singleness and celibacy, or marriage and partnership. And both of these gifts are good and godly. Neither is superior to the other. Uh, married people are not more valuable, or more mature, or more holy than single people, and vice versa. Each person has a gift. The, the gift of marriage is the normative majority gift. That means that most people will be drawn toward marriage. But there are some people, like Paul, who have a different gift. Paul had the gift of celibacy, meaning that God gave him the unique ability to not be bothered by strong sexual desires or feelings of loneliness. Paul was comfortable, both sexually and emotionally, with being single. That is the mark of the gift of celibacy. Uh, the gift of celibacy is marked by, you can put this on the screen, the gift of celibacy is marked by a supernatural contentment with singleness. A supernatural contentment with singleness. People with the gift of celibacy do not desire marriage or marital intimacy. And these people are a rare and wonderful gift to the church and to the mission of God. Number two, if you have the gift of celibacy, stay single. And then number three, if you do not have the gift of celibacy, pursue marriage. Verse eight, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So Paul says that it is preferable to be single as he is if someone has the gift of celibacy. But if they do not have the gift of celibacy, if they burn with passion, then they should get married. So if you have the gift of celibacy, embrace it. Stay single and use your life as a glorious tool in God's hands. But if you don't have the gift of celibacy, 
intentionally pursue marriage. It is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, this is probably the camp that almost all of you singles are in. If you have been in Christian circles for very long, you're probably familiar with the phrase, the gift of singleness, the gift of singleness. Now, I understand what people mean when they when they say that, but I have always found that phrase to be not only unhelpful, but tremendously cruel to our brothers and sisters who want nothing more than a spouse, but are currently single. Now, phrases like the gift of singleness make single people feel like they should be thankful and happy for their singleness, and that their desire for a spouse is a sign of idolatry or misplaced affections. But singles need to know, if you don't have the gift of celibacy, it is good that you desire a spouse. You don't have to hide that desire. You don't have to be ashamed of it. You don't have to pretend like you never think of it. Uh, I've heard countless Christian leaders tell singles things like, once you become completely content in God, then God will bring you a spouse. And I think that is the most mystical prosperity gospel nonsense you could tell a single person. We don't treat any other topic in Christianity like that. We don't say, uh, once you're completely content making no disciples, then God will bring you some disciples. We don't say, once you're completely content never sharing the gospel, then God will lead you to share the gospel. Marriage is a good thing, and it cannot happen passively. Nobody ever got married on accident. Every marriage in history involved activity, initiation, effort. You have to go find a spouse. Go find. Those are verbs. When you tell people uh, you just have to be totally content in God, then he will bring you a spouse. You're basically saying, as long as you put no energy into the marriage, you'll have a marriage. It doesn't make any sense, and it has pushed countless people into unwanted years of singleness. If you are single and you don't have the gift of celibacy, it is good and proper for you to desire marriage, for you to think about marriage, and for you to work toward marriage openly and publicly. You don't have to act nonchalant and disinterested. If marriage is good and you want it, then go get it. Pursue it, just as God tells you to pursue all sorts of holy things. Guys, this is easier for you. Right? Go ask a girl out. Go initiate. Be clear. Don't treat a first date like it's some big commitment. Uh, I wish that I saw way more first dates in our church. Guys taking girls to coffee, getting to know them for an hour or two, and then deciding whether they want to go on a second date. And if you don't, that's fine. Nobody has to be weird around each other the next week. That person is not your ex. You just got coffee with them one time. It's not a big deal. I sometimes hear people criticizing a young man for being a player because he goes out on a lot of dates. And that's interesting to me. So I'll ask, you know, is he mistreating these ladies? No. Is he being manipulative or unclear about his intentions? Well, no. Then that guy is doing exactly what he should be doing. He is pursuing marriage. He is hunting for a spouse. Girls should be drawn to that guy, not away from him. Last week, I got to go down to Boise and celebrate the wedding of one of my best friends. He, he married a wonderful Christian lady, and they're starting a beautiful life together. But in the last five years, he has probably gone on hundreds of first dates. He's used social media pages, dating apps, singles mixers, church events, friend connections, pastor recommendations. He has exhausted every avenue he could think of to find a wife, because he believes that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. He cared about marriage enough to work for it. He didn't just sit passively by and hope that someone fell into his lap. And now he is reaping the reward of a fantastic wife. For you ladies, this is a little bit more complicated uh, because you should not be the primary initiator. That, that is setting a bad precedent for the relationship. But there are tons of things that you can do to, number one, make sure that you are in the right place to meet the kind of guy you want to marry. Number two, make sure that you are the type of woman that the type of guy you want to marry wants to marry. And number three, that your expectations are calibrated appropriately. So first, if you're looking for a godly young man, go put yourself where godly young men are. If I was on an expedition to hunt kangaroos, I wouldn't. it wouldn't make very much sense for me to set up a tree stand in Butte, Montana. 
There are zero kangaroos in Butte, Montana. I should be taking a plane down to Australia and finding the most kangaroo-dense area in the world so that I can find what I'm looking for. Some single women are frustrated that they can't find a husband, but they spend all their time in places that mature and godly men would never go. Yet you're trying to hunt for kangaroos in Butte, Montana. So put yourself where godly young men are. Second, uh, make sure you're the type of woman that is attractive to the type of man that you want to marry. This requires sober self-assessment. It probably requires that you ask an honest friend to tell you the truth about you, your behavior, your habits, your status, your hygiene, your looks, whatever it is. Make sure you, you have, um, make sure you are the type of woman that the type of man you want to marry wants to marry. And third, make sure that your expectations are reasonable. If you want to find a guy who is a Christian, over six feet tall, makes six figures, and is single, I have some bad news for you. Only about one in 10,000 men meet those standards. So care about the things that matter and forget about the things that don't. If you have the gift of celibacy, stay single. If you do not have the gift of celibacy, pursue marriage. Number four, if you are single but do not have the gift of celibacy, you are enduring a trial. If calling singleness a gift is unhelpful, then what is a better term? Well, I would argue that something like trial is more appropriate. It is both more true and it is more helpful. Now, for those who don't have the gift of celibacy, singleness is a trial. It is something being used by God to do something in you and through you, but it is still difficult and uncomfortable and painful. And it is okay to feel that pain. The pain is not a sign that you're being idolatrous or that you are not trusting God enough. But then number five, trials should be endured with joy. Trials should be endured with joy. For those who don't have the gift of celibacy, singleness is a trial, but that doesn't mean that singles should just mope around lamenting their trials. For the Christian, all trials are to be endured with joy. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 through four says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let your steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If you're in this boat, then you are in a trial. That means that God is doing something in you. Your faith is being tested, which leads to steadfastness, stability, trust, perseverance, those are traits that pay off for your entire life and for all of eternity. So you should face the trial of singleness with joy, not because it's all fun or because there's no pain, but because God is doing something in you through the pain. Trials should be endured with joy. Number six, both marriage and singleness have their unique blessings and burdens. Marriage and singleness have their unique blessings and burdens. Uh, verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. Marriage is a beautiful gift. It is a living, walking display of the gospel message. It is companionship. It leads to families. It protects against immorality. It is wonderful. But marriage also has its burdens. Married people have to spend a lot of time and a lot of energy focusing on their marriage. That, that is not optional. They have less availability, less energy, less resources for things outside the home. Singleness is also a beautiful gift. Singleness frees you up from all of that to focus uh, on things outside the home. It frees you up from the focus inside the home to focus on things outside the home. You can put all your attention on your relationship with God and your participation in his mission, but singleness also has its burdens. It can be lonely and dangerous and increasingly so as you get older. Both marriage and singleness have their blessings and burdens. And number seven, singleness is preferable for certain people in certain situations. It's preferable for certain people in certain situations. Verse 26, 
I think, Paul says, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Now, some people take this verse to mean that singleness is a higher, better calling. This is part of why Catholic priests are single, because they mistakenly believe that singleness is a sign of extra virtue or obedience. So why is that interpretation wrong? Why is it not disobedient for Christians to get married when Paul just said, if you are free from a wife, do not seek a wife? Well, it all hinges on that phrase, in view of the present distress. In view of the present distress. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, Corinth was in turmoil. They were in the midst of a severe famine that killed many of the people in the city. They were experiencing devastating persecution against Christians. And they were just a couple decades from the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. Paul is saying, since things are crazy out here right now, you shouldn't get married. He's not saying everybody for all time should stay single. So, for example, uh, if I was about to wrestle a wrestling match and I pulled out a big protein shake, my coach would probably say, hey, because of that match that's about to happen, you probably shouldn't drink that right now. Now, he's not saying you can never drink a protein shake. Uh, I, I almost always encourage young men to go find a wife. I just did that a couple minutes ago. But if the world broke out in nuclear war and all the men were being drafted into the military and everybody's fleeing into the mountains to hide, I would probably tell the guys, hey, hold off on that marriage thing due to this present situation. For people in dangerous, unpredictable, tumultuous situations, singleness is preferable. Marriages generally require quite a bit more stability and predictability to flourish than singleness does. So singleness is preferable for certain people, those who have the gift of celibacy, and for certain situations, those living in extraordinarily tumultuous times. So those are our seven observations today. Some have the gift of celibacy, some do not. If you have the gift of celibacy, stay single. If you do not have the gift of celibacy, pursue marriage. If you are single but do not have the gift of celibacy, you are enduring a trial. Trial should be endured with joy. Both marriage and singleness have their unique blessings and burdens, and singleness is preferable for certain people in certain situations. I pray that our singles can utilize their singleness for the kingdom as long as they are unmarried and find godly spouses if they do not have the gift of celibacy. And may we as a church never regard either singleness or marriage as more holy or more valuable. Each play an indispensable role in the church and in the kingdom. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope that you have a great day.